Hi there, how are you? There was a bit of an echo there. It's it's me. I was trying because I'm doing a PowerPoint. I was trying to log on with my phone separately, but muted to gotcha. see the chat. Gotcha. gotcha. I can be helpful with monitoring the chat. Yeah, that would be great. And I don't mind stopping the PowerPoint sometimes, but I, one of the things that's such a bummer about the Zoom is just like you miss the um, random questions and I don't want to miss random questions. So yeah, if I'll just tell people they can put questions in at any time. And if there's a couple of them, maybe you could yep. um, holler at me or send me a text and then I can um, you got it. So let's stop the PowerPoint to address those. Hi, Nikki. Hi, Kate. Hello. Hello. Hey, Beth. Hey, how's it going? Great, how are you? Good. Are you with a new mortgage company? So my company actually changed names. We got bought oh, cool. um, by an entity that's based out of San Diego, which has actually been cool um, yeah. because we have more products and more programs. Oh, sweet. That's yeah. awesome. So like we can do cool stuff like bridge loans, which nobody else has. Cool. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. What does that mean, Kate? What I don't really. Yeah. yeah. What that means is if you are looking to buy the house, buy a new house before you sell your old house. Mm -hmm. But your equity is tied up in the house that you live in now. Mm -hmm. You can actually borrow the equity from that house to make a down payment on the new house so you can buy first and sell second. And oh. the nice thing is you don't have to be able to qualify for the two mortgages. You only need to be able to qualify for the new house mortgage. Gotcha. Oh, and you don't have to take a home equity loan out to because I feel like people are like trying to do that with a home equity loan, but that's mm -hmm. exactly. But then you have to qualify for all the payments, and that's not always possible because uh, qualifying for two mortgages is tough. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, cool, Kate. That's really exciting. I'm glad Jess. Asked one, that's one of the many exciting things, including like you know you can do um um what we call soft pull credit reports which are credit reports that don't ding your credit score so that you can get a sense of what you can do but not have that hit on your credit report to hurt your scores I mean there's all sorts of fun tricks and tools so we're excited cool. oh, yes. awesome. thank yeah. you for asking Jess so I can yeah. find <laughs> good morning everybody look at all these faces loving it hi everyone like, there's like a whole, you got a whole crew at All Out Adventures. Yeah. <laughs> you, might, you might do some rearranging, but yeah, you got three of us. <laughs> awesome. I would say look, to, because we have like 23, 24 people signed up, I would say, Beth, if you don't mind, let's give it another minute sure. before we do our official. How's everyone feeling? It's nice talking about money. Our anxiety normally just rise slowly <laughs> right who's got snacks because they're feeling nervous because we're going to talk about money anybody have carrot sticks so do you have something crunchy <laughs> or ice cream maybe some ice, ice some emergency ice cream we should do a repeat of this in person and we'll bring the ice cream so then at a like break it. when we're all like <laughs> we go and eat ice cream. Yeah. Hi, Nancy. <laughs> Thanks for saying hi in the chat. So one of the things I was saying to Jess um, when we first started was that I am doing a PowerPoint because it's visual and I think it's helpful to sort of track where we're going. But one of the hard parts about that on Zoom is that sometimes it limits questions or people feel like they can't ask questions because the PowerPoint's up and it's like, you know, in, a, in person, it's easier to interrupt. So if you have a question as I'm going, I would love to hear it. Just pop it in chat and Jess is going to keep an eye on that for me and let me know if there's some questions as we go, because I'll obviously take questions at the end, but it's more fun when they're part of the discussion instead of clumped at the at the end. It makes a more honest conversation. Shall we get started with just the... Uh introductory hellos um and then i'll sort of uh take a long time saying them so that people could be joining but i want to be cognizant of everyone's time 
Hello, my name is Jessica Thompson, and I am the Director of Investor and Community Relations at the Northampton Chamber of Commerce. And one of the cool uh, parts of my job is that I get to um, work with folks like Beth, who have some information, some knowledge, some insight that they are willing to share with others in the chamber community. Um, so we're very fortunate to have Beth Pelletieri here today to talk to us about our relationship with money and how we can think about things maybe through a slightly different um, perspective. Um, and uh, so we're super fortunate and I'm really delighted to see all of your faces here today. Um, our event, our Link and Learn um, events are sponsored by Florence Bank. So I wanted to give them a shout out for continually supporting small businesses and um, their ability to grow and be successful in the community. Before I turn it over to uh, Beth, Vince, would you like to say anything, say hello? Sorry, I was putting my glasses on and off. Uh, <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Vince Jackson, Executive Director of the Greater Northampton Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much, Beth. And thanks to all of you for uh, joining us for this really exciting presentation. Great. Just so everybody knows, we are recording today so that um, folks will have the opportunity to see this if they weren't able to make it uh, to the live presentation. And without any further ado, Beth, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Jess and Vince and the Chamber for having me. I'm super excited to be here. My name is Beth Pelletieri, and I'm a business and life coach. Um, and I love talking about money with my clients because often my folks are heart-centered people who really found their way to business through this sort of self-expression or passion and purpose. And so money wasn't top of mind, or they tend to shy away from those conversations and sort of in, in order to be of service to what they do. Um, and so I'm super excited. We have some nonprofit folks here too, because I think the conversation is really about showing up and building a stronger relationship with money. So thank you Chamber for putting this on and being open to sort of unique perspectives on money and business. Um, and I'm also a member of the ambassador committee with the Chamber, which has been super fun. So thank you for having me. Uh, as I mentioned at the front, I'm gonna do a PowerPoint because it makes it easier to sort of track things and see things and conceptualize them. But I welcome comments and questions as we go. And so I might be taking the PowerPoint down um, so that I can see all of you and also your answers or questions. So with that, I will share my screen. Dun, dun. All right. There we go. So I'm going to just make it a little smaller. So loving your money, a heart-centered approach to building revenue is our topic for today. And um, we're going to spend some time talking about what is money so that we all are working on the same definition. We're going to spend a little time talking about building your relationship with money, because I think of money as any other relationship in our life. And the last section is around building revenue. So my name is Beth. As I said, I'm a certified Martha Beck life coach. Martha Beck is the or OG life coach. Um, so she was the first person that was sort of named a life coach and that's how the job title started. She has lots of books. Um, she writes a column in O Magazine and uh, was Oprah's life coach. Um, but all that to say is she does a really awesome job of blending the science and how our brains and nervous systems work with, um, with some woo and with some uh, just calls for integrity and greater authenticity. And as I said, I mostly work with small business owners who are building their businesses from a place of passion and purpose. Um, and that means talking about where we get stuck with money, especially since my clients don't have MBAs, their goal in building their business wasn't to you know, make as much money as possible. It was to do something they loved and also make money. Um, and so we're also going to talk about stepping into new mindsets and creating pathways for income that feel financially satisfying and delicious. So when I first um, worked, I worked in a nonprofit at a college, um, and it was a sexual and reproductive health nonprofit. And because of that, I taught sex ed. 
and I taught, I lobbied Congress and the United Nations about sex ed policy. So I was talking to lots of people who didn't really want to talk about sex. I was talking to them about sex policy. And at the time that felt really exciting and kind of taboo. Um, but one of the things when we talk about sex education or sex policy is, is that we're thinking about, we know what we're talking about, even if we feel a little shame or embarrassed by the conversation. And one of the things that I think makes money so hard to talk about is that we don't have a common understanding or definition. And we assume that we're missing really important pieces of the puzzle, right? We assume that we don't know enough about investing or about wealth strategies or about budgeting or any of those things. And therefore we start to shrink. Um, and so when we wanna talk about money, we wanna shift our relationship with money so that instead of feeling scary, or dangerous, or like we don't know what we're talking about, or an imposter, we start feeling more confident in how we think and feel and um, discuss money strategies and revenue um, and how much we can do the things we love with money. So I wanted to start with just a little check-in because I do a lot of mind body work in my coaching, which is when you think about money in your business or money in your life, what feelings show up or what physical sensations show up. So I'm gonna encourage you if you feel comfortable to share those in chat and I'm gonna stop share for a second, I think, so we can have a little check-in about how do you feel when you think about money in your life? Anyone? Anxious, great, thank you, Beth. I like the Beth leading the charge tight and uncertain. And you might even notice where that tightness shows up. Is it in your stomach or in your heart space? Or I get a little like itchy sometimes in my throat. Anyone else? Thanks, Jess. No, okay, that's fine. Oh, excited and motivated. Like it, Amanda, awesome. Uncertain, great. Thank you. Pressure, yeah, like a heaviness. Catching up on the early years of not paying attention. So I love that, Gary, because often, right, our money stories can be old. And so maybe we feel financially fine right now. But whenever we think about money, our brain goes to like 20 years ago or 10 years ago or that terrible decision we made once. I feel free to do what I want, but want to be careful. So great. A nice balance of excitement and groundedness, Vince. Stress, lightheaded. Yeah. So I want everyone to write how you want to feel about money next. Relaxed, euphoric, empowered, abundant, carefree, secure. These are great words. Ease, excited and proud of myself. Yes, Nancy. In control. I love that too, right? We want to feel like we have some agency. Ambitious. Anyone else? Oh, wait a second. Okay. So I want you to just notice for a second, and all of us have the capacity to scroll, the energy difference between how we feel about money, right? Anxious, uncertain, lightheaded, stressed, pressure, maybe I didn't do it well enough, right? There's a little like back and forth. And then these awesome words about how you wanna feel, right? Carefree, ease, excited, in control, empowered, right? These are words of joy. And when we talk about money, I really just want you to think about it as a tool for joy because that is ultimately what it is. The reason we want money is for greater self-expression and happiness. And this is the energy that we wanna create when we're building our relationship with money. Okay, really cool. Thank you everyone for sharing. I'm gonna get back to my PowerPoint. This is the awkwardest part of Zoom, watching someone click. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. So let's talk about what is money so that we're all operating on the same definition. So before I started this presentation, I Googled what is money and the internet gave me these three examples. Money is the assets, property and resources owned by someone or something. Money is a commodity accepted by general consent as the medium for economic exchange and money is a system of value that facilitates the exchange of goods in an economy. And quite frankly, when I read this defini defini these definitions, I almost emailed Jess and was like, actually, I can't do this workshop. I don't know about any of these things. <laughs> um, because I think when we think about money, we usually think about this really heavy, economically driven definition of money. 
And that is really not gonna work for heart-centered people <laughs> because this is not why we got into what we do, right? This is actually the antithesis for a lot of people of why we want money. So of course it's gonna feel icky and heavy and maybe a little gross. So let's open up the definition of what money is. First of all, money is just a relationship. And heart-centered people are freaking awesome at relationships, right? We are the best at relationships. We're good at listening. We're good at taking insights from the relationship and applying them. We're good at showing up. We're really good at relationships. Money is a tool for pleasure, as I already said, right? It's an extension of ourselves and what we want and what our values are, right? Whether you want to spend money on uh, your family or on your future, right? It's about who we are and how we show up in the world. Money is actually about fun, full flow, and fulfillment. And money is an extension of our integrity. Martha Beck says our integrity is three components. It's kindness, it's truth, and it's presence. Those three pieces together. And so if we're going to build a relationship with money from integrity, it's going to include honesty, right? Where am I spending or where am I needing more revenue? It's going to include kindness, which is self-compassion, compassion towards ourselves and compassion towards others. And it's going to include the here and now, this moment that we're in right now. So when we spin out 10 years down the line in our retirement savings or something, right, we're going to get out of integrity with money pretty quickly. And I think when we think about money like this, then for heart-centered folks building a business or supporting a nonprofit, it becomes a lot easier to see where we have agency and how we need to shift the relationship for it to feel happy and successful. And so I really like to think about most of the work that I do with clients in two ways. And um, so one is, and pick the words here that work for you. Different people have different um, sensitivities around what words they like to, to use. So feel free to shift to the words that feel good to you. But one is the practical, the action, the strategy. This is sort of the masculine energy component of anything. Um, but in with money, it looks like budgeting or your prices, your revenue, your investing, your purchase power, right? All of the pieces of the action of money. And then we have this other part that we tend to skip over, but is actually, especially for heart-centered folks, especially for folks that have more feminine energy, really important. It's flow, it's pleasure, it's our values, it's our desire, and it's our sense of connection. Now, so often when clients come to me, it's because they're putting the practical first. They're assuming that if they work on their budget, they'll feel better. And what happens when we put the practical first without tuning into the energetic or feminine side is that we budget for like two to three months and then we give up because it's not working or we feel like we're struggling or we're not sure what we're doing. And the same thing is true with business strategies, whether that's revenue or posting on social for more visibility, right? We try it for a couple months, we feel energetically drained and then we need to shift gears. And so when we bring the feminine or the energetic into the light first, it becomes much easier to take those practical steps that fill us up that make us excited and that are in alignment with what we want in terms of flow and value and desire. So now I'm gonna shift into our, I'm just any questions, Jess, are we good? You can do a thumbs up, you're good, okay. Now we're gonna shift gears, thank you, into our relationship with money. So um, again, we're gonna do a little bit of chat. So I want you to imagine your best friend and what, in that relationship is healthy about it. What things do you really value in your best friend? I'll stop my share again. What are the, what do you value in a relationship with your best friend? Communication, dependability, fun. Thank you, Amanda, that's awesome. Accepting me for who I am and vice versa. She believes in my inherent goodness. Humor, compassion, generosity, presence and availability, honesty, love these. So give and take, love it, right? It's reciprocal. And give and take is such a good one because one of the other values of masculine energy versus feminine energy is that masculine energy is actually about giving and doing and feminine energy is about receiving. And so pointing out that give and take, that flow, that balance is really important. Showing up no matter what, communication and support, compassion sees me for who I am, understanding, open communication, honesty, honesty, trust, 
being able to talk to each other's life issues, enjoying each other's company and connections. Right, these are really great words for a healthy relationship. So who feels like they have these words judgment-free? Thank you, Kate, right, right, no judgment, right? No shame, no like you did it wrong. So who feels like they have these words in their relationship with money? Vince, awesome. Yeah, this is tricky because we have these when it's a person, but when it's money, it feels amorphous sometimes. Gary, awesome, you think so? Okay, so we're gonna talk about building more of this into our relationship with money. Do, do. So when we think about our relationship with money and building a relationship, it's honest, right? We're saying like, oh, this is what I need or this is what I want or this is what I'm spending on or this is where I wanna build more money, more revenue into my business. We're talking about trust. And trust is a really tricky thing when we think about money. I think as someone pointed out earlier, right? If we've had a distrustful relationship with money in the past or in our childhood, sometimes it's really hard to build trust with money. That's a really important part of creating, right? You can't build a relationship with trust without trust. So it's sometimes the most important of these. There's listening and curiosity and openness. You make decisions together or you collaborate on decisions. You support each other's goals and you have fun together. And when we have these components with money, it's much easier to build revenue because we are trusting that we have a partner in building money or raising money and in bringing in what we need because we are honest about what we need. We're trusting that the other partner hears us. We're making decisions together. We're supporting each other's goals and we're having fun together, right? We're being in flow with what we want and what the other person needs. So when you think about your relationship with money, you might notice, do you think that money has all the power? <laughs> or do you feel like you can say what you need and want like, hey, money, I really need a little more this month. Um, and here's why. Are you able to build your relationship with money from a, from a place of abundance or about excitement as opposed to a place of fear or not enough, right? Sometimes we shrink in our relationship with money. And the other thing that comes up is sometimes we feel like we have to chase money, right? Like money is constantly running away from us and we just have to like run right after it, which is also not a relationship that you would want to be in. If, if it was a person. So I thought it would be helpful to see what kinds of, I, I posted in here or I shared in here a lot, too much social media if I'm posting at PowerPoint. Um, so I put in here some mindsets that clients have had about money when we talk about building their relationship with money. And the goal is not to you know list out all the possibilities, but hopefully in some of them for you to see and notice in your body, like, oh, I can feel that one or that's really interesting, that shows up for me too. Um, because when we clear these blocks around our relationship with money, it of course becomes much easier to create more money and to build revenue. Um, one of the things that's really interesting generally is that we tend to have a maximum and minimum threshold in our nervous system for how much money we feel safe with. And so when we're thinking about building more revenue into our business, we have to make sure that we're clearing the blocks and tending to our nervous system so we can imagine a more abundant future for ourselves. And often what happens if we don't do that work is that when we receive more money, we spend it or we find a way to get rid of it because it doesn't actually feel good to our nervous system. And so this might not be your story, but it is a story I often see with clients. And so we wanna be clear about where we don't feel safe going in our relationship with money and how to mm, tend to that so we can expand and, um, and rise up to do awesome things with money. So this first client said, I don't know what to do with money like ever. Um, and with this business client, one of the things we noticed was not that she had a negative or a positive relationship with money, but that she often outsourced her relationship with money to quote unquote experts like bookkeepers and accountants. And so for her, we were really just working on rebuilding a relationship with money because she had sort of forgotten to tend to that in her own way. The other thing that shows up with money is having to trust ourselves more fully, right? If we want more money, we have to put ourselves out there more, or we have to trust that we're ready for the promotion, or to hire more staff, or to hit our growth edge in a new way. 
And so just owning the fact that to make more money, I have to trust myself more fully, and that's scary. Um, so that can be a really powerful growth edge, which is less about money and more about sort of how much space we feel safe taking up. So I hear this one a lot from my clients, again, because they tend to be heart-centered. I cannot tell you the amount of times I have heard, I don't want to be a capitalist pig. Like some version of that shows up just all the time with my clients. And I love it because the truth is none of my clients want to be um, capitalist in the way that we are harming other people or oppressing other people. Oop, no, no backwards. Um, what we want to do is build our business from a place of tenderness and from love and from being of service to the world and letting the money come second. But the truth is when we have a belief about not being selfish or not showing up fully for our dreams, then we are sort of limiting ourselves. It's like a wet blanket on what we can achieve. And the truth is the world needs more heart-centered business owners who are building businesses and creating revenue and also care about the world. Because I actually fundamentally believe that's how the revolutionary side of myself believes that's actually how we're going to create lasting change and the earth needs lasting change right now. So we have to allow for the place that there's, you know, a billion shades of gray between like not earning enough and, you know, Jeff Bezos. Um, and we get to fall wherever we want on that scale. So the other thing that often shows up with heart-centered folks is I need the income from the clients I have and I don't wanna lose any. And I think this shows up when I see clients ready to grow or expand their offerings or are ready to pivot a little bit on how they're thinking about their purpose and the passion and why they built their business. And that really comes from caring about the people you serve. And that's a beautiful thing. But when we think about how we can serve our clients best and how we can be of greatest service to the world, right? Fill our cup and then be of service. We also have to know that some of our clients or customers or people that we work with might now be better served by someone else or that there's a way we can bring them along on the journey that, that feels good to us and isn't sort of separating from the clients that we are ready to let go of. Um, and I see this a lot, especially with health and wellness folks, that we feel like we have to keep taking care of the same populations, um, but that actually is in a, in a service of our own professional or personal growth, and we can find other ways around that. And this is one of my favorites, talk about capitalism showing up hard. So I have to work hard to earn money. So unless you are working like I Love Lucy style with the chocolates and the conveyor belt, this isn't true anymore. You don't have to work harder to earn more money. In fact, when we're in flow and we're in feminine energy of pleasure and play and fun, we can actually work less hard and earn more money. So when we notice the relationships, and I see that we have two comments, so I'll jump over there in a second or Jess can fill me in. They're good, that's okay. All right. Um, when we're staying present to our money mindsets, our relationship with money, the first thing to do is to just stay present with your experience with your money. So one of the things that I often give as homework with clients is to spend time with your revenue, right? Like look at it, celebrate it, be excited about it, notice it, notice whether or not you can stay present to the amount of money that you are earning every month. Because if we want to make more money, we have to first be happy with the money we're receiving. And sometimes this can be a really tricky exercise on your nervous system, but it's well worth it to build that relationship with money. Notice your thoughts about money and your work and how they show up and um, where they feel good. So I know lots of people had some money thoughts that felt really good to them. So savor those, amplify them, write them on a post-it note and put them next to your desk. And notice the thoughts that are feeling a little itchy or scratchy in your body and that you want to wiggle so that you can clear those and make more money. Feel your feelings. So if you're going to build trust, you have to notice where you had a distrust with money in the past. Maybe there's anger, maybe there's sadness or grief. It's okay to feel your feelings about money. If this is a real relationship, you want to feel those feelings so you can move past it and collaborate together on a new era of your relationship with money. Be honest and specific um, about what you want and how you want to grow your money conversation and relationship. And I would just say for most heart-centered folks, this is a growth edge because again, you didn't go get an MBA. You 
got your degree in something else or you put your attention in something else and now money is showing up as sort of a barrier to where you want to go next so be gentle and kind with yourself and if it's feeling really hard or you have some financial trauma to either seek professional support like a financial therapist a financial advisor who can help you more directly with some of your money goals or a coach if that's also of service so think about if you need help there's lots of people in this arena doing different things that are awesome that can help you feel grounded and build your relationship with money. So I wanted to end this little section with a Rachel Rogers quote. Rachel Rogers has a great book out there called We Should All Be Millier Millionaires that talks about women and folks of color taking up more space and access with their relationship with money. Um, and she says, making money and making the world a better place are not mutually exclusive. So before we talk more specifically about building revenue, I want to check in if there's any questions and I'll just stop the share again so we can see if there's questions. Did anyone want to talk about where their mindsets are showing up or what they notice for themselves? Yeah, go ahead, Vince. Okay, where were you 19 years ago when I started my business? <laughs> uh, so I'm looking at this with a look back to 19 yeah. years ago. And uh, my goal when I started my marketing consulting business, you know, I was one of those with that MBA and it was like every year I got to make more money than I made the year before. And then and now that I'm leading a nonprofit, I still have that sort of mindset from a growth standpoint. Mm -hmm. We got to get more members than we got last year or whatever. But what I, what I found interesting in this analysis is that um, the masculine side investing stood out for me. And one of my grandmother's favorite sayings was, it takes money to make money. Mm. And as I learned in my 19 years is that investing, spending to get new clients, to get new projects, to do the things, that generated every single one of the feminine Ooh. qualities, which is like, this is an aha moment for me. So it leads to a question, and we see this in parts of our portfolio of members. And as we talk to the role of chambers in you know, economic development and business building, how do people, and you said this heart-centered approach. Um, so how do people, how do we advise people? How would you like coach people through this, this balance of oh, I'm starting a business because this is my passion and my hobby and my thing that I really want to do with, uh, I need to generate cash because that's what makes a business successful. So how yeah. do you balance that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it is especially hard in the startup phase, right? Because you're hustling, yeah. right? There's a certain amount of just like hustle that has to happen when you're building something new. And the best way that I work with it with clients is I think about it in two ways. We, we want to build your yacht, right? Like we want to build your yacht, the clients that fill you up, the people that are awesome, that light you up, the passion and purpose. And then we got to build you a dinghy so that you're not stuck in scarcity with money while you get there. And so the dinghy can still be aligned with your integrity and your passion and purpose. But it might not be, per it's not going to be perfect because it's sort of the vehicle to get you to the yacht. Um, and so you really need both components. And I think that when we're thinking about money and um, Jess recently asked everyone on the ambassador committee of the chamber for advice. And I think so often people, or even when I was starting out, honestly, going to a chamber event with this energy of like hustle or scarcity, or like, I don't have enough money and I'm going to need more business or whatever that looks like for you. And, um, and when we're in that energy, it's almost impossible to build a healthy relationship with money because we're in fear, right? Scarcity and, and not enough is, and I'm going to talk about this in the next section too, is, is sort of a repellent, right? For money. When I'm in resistance to what comes next, I'm not gonna make money. 
And I've actually noticed that in my business, when there's these moments of fear that show up, like you should, right? The revenue isn't going as well because I'm just not in flow and in connection with my money and with the work of my calling in my business. And so we really want to help people stay in flow. And that means being concrete about what they're building now and that that doesn't have to be the same version as what they're building in the future, right? When they're out of the startup phase, that it can, it's okay that you have a startup phase, but you have to make it secure enough that you can get to the next phase and feel healthy instead of feeling burned out and filled with exhaustion. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Cool, all right, all out adventure crew. Hi there. Um, hi. hi, I'm Sue. And um, I guess I had a couple questions. Um, I, like I, I hear you on the feminine aspect of being heart-centered around money, um, but I also feel that like capitalism today, like where 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 it's gone is like it's like a distorted masculine. Mm. I feel like we need the masculine, the feminine and the masculine, but the masculine oh. imbalance, like to provide to, you know, and um so I'm just I'm thinking about that and how that would look concretely. And also like any thoughts you have on like hanging out with friends or associates that are more wealthy, that know how to do this, that know how to invest or, um, because like here at All Out Adventures, we are, we're super heart focused. We're so heart focused. Our heart is like out on the street getting like run over by the truck sometimes. And, you know what I mean? Like, so like, how do we, you know, how do we do that? Um, and then finally you said financial therapist. I thought that was very interesting. and. Um, I wonder how it travels along the same path as other therapy to change beliefs. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just trying to write your questions so I can try to answer them all. So it was the heart out on the street. Yes. Too much masculine energy and financial therapist. Was I missing anything? Um, oh, hanging well, out with invest wealthier friends. Yeah. Like just wealthier, the folks that are super comfortable with having more money and yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And there it is. Um, so financial, I'll just start with financial therapist because that's super practical. One of my favorite people to follow if you're new to this work is Barry Tesler. She was an accountant and somatic healer and write, write, wrote a couple books called The Art of Money and of course has a podcast, but she's really grounded and talks about how to um, sort of be with your feelings, um, with your money and um, also really, um, encourages like a values-based budgeting system, which I started following her like five years ago and shifted my budgeting that way. So it's based, a budget based, our household incomes, I base, I, val I budget based on our val family values that we came up with together. And I was like a huge game changer for me. So she's a really great person on sort of taking steps if that's where you're at. Um, so that's the finance. So I think, so yes, every capitalist, the, the system of capitalism that we are operating under now is super masculine and patriarchal because white supremacy, right? It's all the things that have gotten us this far. And so I, first of all, like that is true. And I think what's happening and the shift that I'm seeing that's super cool is that more and more people who wouldn't have claimed themselves as like a business owner or a small business owner are taking up space in capitalism and shifting the energy. And so we are doing business with each other because it feels damn good. And we are excited and collaborating in ways that are awesome and have bring a lot of feminine energy to business. And so I think that there's space for, right? Of course, it's about harmony and about bringing it into balance. And so I think that that's what's happening and it's super exciting. And we're all a different unique mix of masculine and feminine energy and how we find flow and connection and practical, like. I wouldn't be a business coach if I didn't love strategy. So, right, we, that's to me my more masculine side. We all have that mix. And so bringing that mix into the light is super cool and allows everyone to be in the business space from a place of greater integrity. So the greater integrity is gonna be my lead in for answering your questions about heart out on the curb and wealthier friends. So when we start with flow and we start with integrity in our relationship with money, then one of the things that starts shifting is that we actually want to take care of ourselves first 
before we leave our heart out on the curve. To me, the heart out on, like, and I came from nonprofit world. So the heart out on the curve is not of service long-term to the work that I believe needs to happen in sort of a fundamental shift, um, right? We have to take care of ourselves and then, right? Oxygen mass, we have to take care of ourselves and then take care of others. And so when we're doing that work and rebuilding our self-trust with money, that can feel really uncomfortable. And the same thing is true with the wealthier friends, right? If my inner wisdom and my integrity is telling me to talk to wealthier friends or, you know, like do a, you know, whatever, then that is tied to who I am and my own relationship with money. But if I'm going into wealthier friends asking for their investment advice from a place of grasping or me not being enough or not having a strong enough relationship with money, then that's going to feel really icky and not going to be of service to my own growth. So I think it's all grounded in integrity. Does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. And again, like it's just reinforcing like through life, it's like we have to start with a relationship to ourselves. Yeah, and totally. Specifically to my, our, my relationship to money. First. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I see a comment. I'm curious what other standards, expectations. I love a friend analogy when money has agency. Yeah. Great lead in because we're going to talk about manifesting next. So it'll get a little woo, but I want to encourage, I want to say for the folks, what's so cool about to me about when I talk to clients about manifesting the money they want or the revenue they want is that it's actually all grounded in neuroscience. So whether you believe in the science or the woo, um, it's there is research here that is really cool. And if you want more neuroscience facts, I will um, be happy to share them with you after the call. Um, so Danielle, I think that's where you're headed. Is that right? To sort of, how do you build the expectations for money? And I will say part of it is being honest with money about what you want and need. Right. So I think that sometimes we're hiding from money and if we're hiding from money, we can't be honest about what we want. Was that sort of the, where your question was going or did I miss it? Well, in the friend analogy, I think like when we have relationships with people, like we can set an expectation and a boundary. Yeah. And with money, I think it's really hard. Like if my friend is not communicating with me well, I can be like, okay, I'm going to deprioritize this relationship or communicate my need. And I guess I'm wondering like, where does money even have the ability to be a good friend? Yeah. So um, it's like, it's like such a, a novice, like what is even possible? Like yeah. what's a really great relationship with money look like? And how do we like make money a friend? Yeah. I guess what we're doing, but anyway, yeah, that no, I love it. Um, so one of the easiest ways that I know to help people build their relationship with money is by slowing down and by feeling it in your body. So if you are going to spend, um, all right, I'm going to use Amanda's here. I recently, Amanda runs copycat. I recently needed to buy some swag. I reached out to Amanda so I can feel the amount of money that I wanted to spend on swag and also the amount of money I did spend on swag in my body. I can feel it in my core. I can feel it in my heart and it feels really good. I'm like really excited about the swag. So, um, and how much, and I, right. And, and the relationship I had with money around the swag. And so if I was going to double how much I spent on swag, I can also feel that in my heart and my stomach, my stomach starts to turn into a knot or like a pit that it's sort of like a pit that's gluing itself around like a tightness and my heart tends to let's say I'm gonna just do this real so my heart also starts to cave in and like turn inwards so to me that's how money is setting a boundary with me right money is actually telling me like this doesn't feel good to you so I think we can't do that when we're not in relationship. And I think that's why I said one of my best homework assignments is sometimes like go look at your revenue sheet and see how much you can be excited about how much money, you, regardless of the amount, how much money you made this month. Because if we're constantly tell money, telling money, it's not enough, you're not showing up for me, you suck, right? That's not a healthy relationship. But what we can say to money is, thank you so much for showing up this month. I really appreciate it. And I'd like another $500. <laughs> so we have to build that communication from a place of trust. And that means trusting that money will show up first. We don't actually need bound. We don't really want boundaries with money. We want to break some boundaries with money, 
but we need to do that in a way that's reciprocal. Does that make sense? I think it's really important to surround your people that are happy with making money. Yeah, that's beautiful, Amanda, too, right? The people that are excited that we're making more money. Cool. All right, I'm going to return. We have 15 minutes left, so I will return to the PowerPoint. Great questions, everyone, though. It's really fun to answer your questions. So we're going to talk about building revenue. And the biggest take home for everyone is like when you trust your vision and put your pleasure and happiness first, money always follows. That is really the, the take home of this section. So to answer your question too, Danielle, money is an energy and it likes flow, right? It likes currency is flow. It's like moving things back and forth and it likes alignment and integrity. It does not like rules. If you're like money, you can come in, but only in this specific way. It's kind of going to like, it, you need to sort of open up your definition. It doesn't want you to play small. Money doesn't, right? As a good friend, we want to elevate ourselves. And money is not going to come if we need it to prove to us that we're worthy. The self-worth comes within and radiates outwards. If we think money needs to show up for us to be worthy, then it's not really going to be, again, a healthy relationship. And one of the things I've noticed again and again with my clients is that when they focus on building revenue for building revenue sake, when they're like, I need more money, they get stuck. And when they focus on why, like, I want to go on more vacations, I want to hire more people, I want to um, get the house of my dreams, then they get inspired, excited, and ready for action. And they are able to sink into clarity with their vision. So when we think about creating more revenue in our business or in our work, we want to start with the why of it and really, which is what gets us into energetic flow. And then the money follows as opposed to being like, oh, I need this much more money. And I'm going to sort of disagree with myself about this in a second. But in terms of a general principle for building revenue, starting with the why is really key for feeling inspired, excited and in flow so that we can take those practical steps. So I'm gonna ask you, how do you show up differently if you believe your happiness is possible? Now, for most people, I find that we're sort of assuming that like 10 to 50 to maybe 60% of our um, happiness is possible. And when we believe that only a partial amount of our happiness is possible, that's sort of what we create for ourselves. But if you believe that your happiness is completely possible, then you're gonna show up at 100% or 110%. And you can even feel that shift in your body, right? Like you're just gonna feel more alive, more excited, more ready to connect and to do things that are in service of your happiness because you believe it's 110% possible. So I'm gonna talk about manifesting now because I think it's an important strategy for heart-centered people when we're thinking about creating revenue. And it also takes us out of this like must make more money mindset, which often gets us stuck. So the first step in manifesting is to know what you want to create, whether that's, um, you know, I'm going to speak to our nonprofit folks, like a certain grant that you want to receive or a um, five more clients or four more gigs or um, a certain amount of revenue. Even we want to say what we want to create and be specific. So again, this works better when we're specific about our vision and our desires. It also really has to be something that you believe you can create. So I could try to manifest a private island for myself. It won't work because that's not really what I want in my life or what, right? That doesn't at all connect to my why. So we want to think about the things we want to create that are specific, that we can feel it in our body and our mind and our soul, and that we can really anchor in. It needs to have the roots and also this sort of expansion. So we're really grounded in that energy. And so this is the first step sometimes with clients after we've cleared those money blocks is getting really specific about what do you wanna create? What would make you, what is your version of happiness next? So the next part is where I think people get lost on manifesting because if we think about manifesting as a passive act, then we would all be manifesting amazing things on our couch. And that's not really how it works. So the next part of manifesting is that we have to believe the outcome of what we want so hard, be it that 100% my happiness is worth it place, that we do all the possible things to make it happen because we already believe it's true. So if you already believe that you're going to have five more clients or get that grant, you're going to do all the things 
that you can do because you already trust that it's going to happen. It's not a passive process. It's a really active one. So when we are doing all the things to make our outcome true, one, there's two byproducts of that. One is that the mindsets that are in that threshold of like, you're only allowed to build this much revenue or you're only allowed to get this much show up. So we, first of all, have to be in sort of um, flexibility with the mindsets that are trying to keep us safe so that we can blow them up, bypass them and get to our outcome. So the first thing that happens when we start taking our happiness and our money more seriously is that we notice our growth edge. We notice the mindsets that are keeping us safe and not in expansion. And when we start shifting the mindsets that are keeping us safe and small, smaller, our nervous system usually has a little bit of a reaction, right? It doesn't feel so safe to our, to our mind-body system to say, I want five more clients this month because there's a part of us that is afraid of that. Even if that feels, you know, we all have a part of us that's afraid of change. It's just a natural part of the human condition. And so part of manifesting also means tending to your nervous system. And I do a lot of self-compassion exercises with clients. Um, if you are um, um, like self-compassion stuff, the Center for Mindful Self-Compassion is just awesome. I've done a lot of training with them, but it's really about how do we take care of our nervous system uh, while we're on a growth trajectory. And then the last part of manifesting is surrender and trust. So if we trust money and we really believe in the relationship and our happiness and that money is gonna show up for our happiness, then we let go of how that money shows up and we stay aligned with that higher energy, the, our purpose, right? If I really trust that like um, in sort of spaciousness of a new home, or in the spaciousness of being able to hire more people for my business or all the things I'm gonna use that money for, then it doesn't totally matter to me how that money shows up. So I can stay in alignment with my relationship with money. And I have to tell you, this has worked over and over again with clients. They've manifested the coolest things um, and all of the things that they've manifested are specific to their integrity and their business and how they wanna build revenue next. And that allows them to catapult into the next part of their business because they're in trust and they're in flow. And they stay connected to my five Ps, which is sort of where this presentation is gonna slow down today. So again, if there's sort of some take homes from today, and I encourage you to think about like two to three take homes from the presentation, because if you try to think about all the things, um, it makes it really hard for our brain to absorb. So maybe even as I'm talking, write down two or three things, insights that you wanna take with you after this presentation is over. But one of the things that I've noticed again and again is that when my clients are putting passion and purpose, they're calling the thing that lights them up first, and they're matching that with pleasure and play. So they're taking activities that feel fun or activities, I've been parenting too long. Um, they take, uh, do strategies or take action steps in their business that are pleasurable and fun for them. And they kind of release that outcome, right? Play is like a creative energy, releasing the outcome, doing things that you think are exciting and energizing and staying true to who you are and what you're trying to cultivate in your life. Money always follows because money wants you to be happy. It is, it really does. And so when we believe that unconditionally and we build more happiness into our business and how we take up space in our business, then the natural outcome of that is watching people's revenue triple and quadruple because they're in alignment with the work they're supposed to be doing and they're trusting their relationship with money. So when you think about your revenue, how do you want to build revenue in your business or income in your life or, or financial satisfaction for your clients? from a place of joy. And when we match money and happiness as money is already a tool of happiness, magical, awesome, exciting, and really truly empowering things start happening. Um, and that is the best part, right? We're taking up more space and we're doing more stuff with that. So I just wanted to, I'm gonna break for questions after this slide, but um, if you are interested in working with me or learning more about my work, I run a group coaching program for small business owners. Um, the next cohort is starting March 29th. It's two months. There's weekly videos and coaching sessions. And it's really sort of my accessible offer for, um, 
for small businesses um, in a group setting. So you really get to build community. I offer a free 30 minute intro session to anyone um, available on my website. So if you're interested or want to talk about this more, but even aren't sure if coaching is the right fit for you, but want to sort of dissect this, feel free to book a session. I'd be more than happy to use this as a follow-up from the presentation today. Um, I have a free Facebook group where we talk about all this yummy stuff that anyone is welcome to join. And you can always reach me by email or on Instagram where I spend way too much time. So I will break for questions. So I know the manifesting stuff I went through fast. So does anyone have any questions on sort of that last chunk? And I went through it kind of fast because I was thinking that there would be questions on sort of how to apply it to you. Does anyone have a manifesting or an intention about where they want to increase their revenue that they want to talk through? I can do that too. How do you get out of a rut? Amanda, could you talk more specifically about the rut? Thank you, Nancy. So if things just seem to not be going the way you want them to be, and uh, you're feeling like you're having bad luck, I think that it's easy to have your attitude kind of turn and it's difficult to envision like that flow and the positivity. So how would you recommend turning that around if you're in a situation like that? Yeah, that's a great um, thing. So one of the things that, and why manifesting works is a part of our brain called the RAS, focuses on whatever we're focusing on. So when we have a string of bad luck or things aren't going our way or we're not getting opportunities that we want, our brain will start focusing on the things that are not working because that's how it, that's how our brain operates. If you ever have like been trying to buy a new car and then suddenly you notice all the brands of cars out on the road and you never noticed it before, that's your RAS working. Um, so one of the small shifts, and I always say like when we get stuck, the best tool is to slow down. We tend to speed up because we want to make it better or we get a little frantic, but the best thing is always just to slow down. So I would start, um, I would start writing down the things that are going well. And you can do this in a couple ways. I sometimes recommend to clients to start an I am awesome journal where they write like two to three things that are going really well for them every day. Um, and that one thing is like too easy, but two to three things makes your brain stretch a little bit. It can be something you're proud of. It can be something that really gave you a lot of energy or flow. And when we write those things, we're retraining our brain back into flow and happiness. And we're starting to connect the dots on what's going well and what we're trying to amplify instead of what's making us feel stuck or unworthy. And that sometimes means like we don't want to right? Gaslight ourselves out of, like, if we're really in a bad mood, we don't want to be like, never mind, I'll just be happy because that's toxic po positivity and that doesn't serve anyone. But when we're noticing that we're just pointing out to ourselves all the things that aren't working, then we want to shift that mindset. And the best way to shift that mindset is to, is to point out to our brain the good things, the awesome things that we did, we did. Um, especially when we're hitting a new growth edge in our business. It can really feel easy to feel imposter or insecure. And when we start noticing, like, I freaking did an awesome presentation today, it makes a huge difference in our energy and flow. Um, Danielle, what do you do when clients or potential clients say they cannot afford your services? I feel like that always gets me out of flow and I offer a discount. Ooh, great question. So, um, so one of the things that I, so yes, so this does happen, but off, so I'm going to think about how I want to answer it. I think when, so first of all, the reason that it gets you out of flow is probably because there's a part of you that's believing it to be true. So you're immediately sort of compromising your integrity to, and feel free to tell me where I'm wrong, but compromising your integrity to make it yourself more accessible to them, to make yourself safer to them. And that's okay, that's like a heart-centered person strategy of a lot of things. But for me, when I when clients say they can't afford my services, often that has to do with where they get stuck taking up space. So investing in yourself or investing in what you want and hiring another business to do that work for you can feel really scary and overwhelming. 
And so usually when I work with clients, it's not that I don't take that seriously, because of course I do, but I try that usually the money is not actually the thing that's important. It's that they're struggling with some other part of it and money is the most obvious way of articulating that. And so usually I actually just try to coach, like, coach them around that a little bit. I also, when I um, initially raised my prices um, a while back, I decided to have a certain amount of sliding scale spots. So for me, that's how I can still be of service to people at a lower price point as I have two, I have two sliding scale spots. And so if those are full, I don't offer a sliding scale, but there's other ways that I can still be of service to those people, um, like book suggestions or giving them my email if they have any questions afterwards. So I think sometimes when we get stuck on prices, one, it's that we're believing that as like the end all be all. And so we shut down. And the two is before you next meet with a, a new potential client, I would write yourself out some of your own boundaries, like um, especially when we're a solopreneur, writing an inter-office memo to yourself can be really, really helpful. So write an inter-office memo of how you might serve people that can't afford your services in a way that feels an integrity for you. So that when that happens, instead of being surprised by it, you can pull out, pull up that little lovely document and say, I have two sliding scale spots. They're already filled. Here's some recommendations of resources. And if you need anything, feel free to email me. Does that help? Any other questions? Cool. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for showing up, for talking about money. Hopefully your nervous system is not feeling up here and back down here in your body where it, where it deserves to live. And um, yeah, this was super fun. So thank you. Thanks for the chamber for putting this on. Thank you so much, Beth. Thank you, everybody, for being here. We really appreciate your time and attention and connection with the Chamber community. And um, Beth, thanks so much for sharing your insight. And thank you to Florence Bank for making this series possible. Um, we have more events coming up always. Um, so please check out the community connector so you can um, stay in touch. If you're not already a part of that subscription list, just go to northamptonchamber.com and you will get a pop-up and you'll be able to sign up and keep on top of everything. Thank, Thank you, you. Thanks everyone. Have a great Thank day. <laughs> Appreciate it. Bye. I just